Hello, this is Joe McGee. You know, we've been doing seminars across the country for years. Seminars on marriage, parenting, men, money, and family. We want to encourage you to email us and let us know if this podcast has helped you. Or maybe you have joined us live at one of our seminars. If you have a testimony, you just want to tell us what God's doing in your life, please email us at mail at joemcgeeministries.com or you can contact us through our website, joemcgeeministries.com. There you will find helpful articles and tools to help you grow in God, your marriage, and your family. We love you guys. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hey, everybody. This is Angel, and uh, Joe is not here today. Well, he will be here later today because he's recording, but I am here with my special guest, Kim Hart. She is joining us with a special message. Welcome, Kim. All right. Thank you for having me here, Angel. I'm excited to be here. Um, like you said, I met you many, many years ago. I mm-hmm. think it was probably 25 years, 24, 25 years ago. It yes. was a long time ago. A very long time ago. And, you know, as most of us, as little girls do, I had my whole life planned out ahead of me. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian home, went to Christian schools, married a Christian man, you know, volunteered in church, tithed. Um, I was a good girl. Yes, you were. And, <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, my life began to fall apart, and it did mm. not happen the way I had scripted my life to be. Um, I had been married probably about um, three years when I began to find out that my husband had an affair. And being raised in the church, um, you know, I knew God can heal, and I forgave, um, and I forgave, and I forgave again, right. and things kept going on. And I found myself just, you know, getting into this pattern of forgiving, sweeping it under the rug, hoping things would change, and things didn't change. Mm. So in 2013, I had been married almost 23 years. Wow. And I had reached a point where I couldn't go on anymore. And so in 2013, I made a decision that um, it was time for me to um, file for divorce and end my marriage. Right. And I'll never forget getting in the car, um, you know, going down to the courthouse. I had asked my father to drive me. And when I left the courthouse, there was such a blanket of shame that wrapped around me that day. Right. Um, I remember feeling like I was a J.C. Penney's or a Cole's return. Wow. And I had a stamp on me that said damaged goods. I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, you do. You feel branded. Absolutely. Well, and there was a shame of, you know, when you take a return to a a department store, they ask you, what's the reason for return? Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had to say, owner changed his mind. Mm. And from that day, there was a shame I walked through because not only did I feel like a failure as a mom, Mm -hmm. because I didn't want my children to be raised in a, you know, come from a broken home. So I felt like I, I had failed them. By, by filing for divorce, I felt like I was a failure as a Christian, mm-hmm. because a, as a Christian woman, I thought, I have let God down. Right. Um, and then on top of that, so I, I failed as a wife, because mm-hmm. if I would have been a good enough wife, you know, this wouldn't have happened. Right. And then the kicker is my profession is a licensed marriage and family therapist. Of course. And so there was the failure and the shame that came on with that, saying, you know what? Um, here I'm telling other people what to do to work on their relationships and their marriages, and here mine's falling apart. Yeah, I mean, the enemy always goes after what you do and what you are. I mean, he tries to go at the very root of it. So then a few years went by, and you were getting healthy, and life was moving on. You were raising your kids. Yep, four years went by. Mm-hmm. And in that four years, I had, I still was standing for a reconciliation in my marriage. There was still a point of, I knew God could still do things, but man has free will. And God does not supersede man's free will. And so at the end of four years, I had told my ex husband that I was not going to see anybody, date anybody for the four years. My, my youngest children at the time were 16 when I divorced. And I was not going to date anybody for those four years and just be a full-time mom because I didn't want to bring anyone into the home. I didn't want to disrupt their lives. Right. And so that four years was coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And I had said, get your act together. Let's revisit this in four years. 
um, because I knew that there was still that opportunity. Sure. During that four years, though, I was also allowing myself to grieve. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, did you ever see that um, CNN news piece on, there was an orca whale a few years ago, the, uh, mother whale, uh-huh. and it gave birth to a calf, and that calf did not survive. But it was on CNN, and this orca whale carried this calf on its back for 17 days. It was a dead calf. Wow. And every time that calf would slide off of its back, the mother would swim back underneath and get it back up and carry it. Mm -hmm. And it traveled, you know, thousands of miles. And CNN labeled that as this orca whale had a tour of grief. Oh, wow. And during that four years, I had a tour of grief. Which is so important. You know, I went through the same thing. Mine was, I don't know that it was four years. It was probably a little bit longer, but it was, it was a, it was a process that if you don't go through it, you're going to take that into the next step of your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those four years, that tour of grief is there was grieving um, the things that I had imagined, you know, the fairy tale life that was supposed to be. I grieved what was. Well, that's the thing is I always tell people it's not necessarily as much what you lost, it was what was supposed to become, like being together, growing old with your grandkids, you know, uh, retiring together, enjoying, you know, you know, what you thought your life was going to turn out like. Absolutely. So you grieve what should have been, Mm -hmm. what could have been, what you imagined from the future. So it's this process of grief. Right. And during that time, in those four years, I allowed myself to begin grieving that and accepting that Mm -hmm. um, in that this was coming to an end. Mm Mm-hmm. And so at the beginning of 2017, it was January, and I just felt a stirring in my heart that it was time for me to move forward. My tour of grief was coming to an end. And I went to my parents and I said, I want you to pray with me that the right person is going to come into my life. I'm ready. I want to be with somebody. I'm ready for love to open my heart again. And it was probably less than a few weeks, and I went back to my mom, and I said, the funniest thing, Mom, I felt in my heart, like God was saying, by the end of this year, I'm going to be married. Wow. And I said, and I feel like God told me, buckle my seatbelt, because it's going to go fast. That's an important part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Very. I didn't quite know what that buckle mm-hmm. my seatbelt was, was preparing me for. Right. Um, and so I, I, you know, and was, let me just say for those of you listening, buckle your seatbelt because <laughs> this story is about to get crazy. <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> um, it's like this, it was this roller coaster. So I'm buckling my seatbelt. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. And, um, on April one, it was actually April fool's day. Right. I had a blind date with my husband. Nice. And as I pulled up to the restaurant, he was waiting outside the restaurant kind of leaned over the the little metal fence, and he was looking for me. And I remember that just made such an impression on me that he was waiting for me. He was looking for me. I love that. Um, Now, and when we share the rest of the story, people will understand. I tease him now that that the joke was on him on April Fool's Day. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we, we were dating, and we were seeing each other every night, and we had only dated about maybe three weeks, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, I want to marry you. Wow. And if you know my husband, that is not my husband's personality. He's a chemical engineer, and he's very analytical, um, very thought through. He's not impulsive. And I didn't know what to say when he said that because I knew that I wanted to marry him, but I wasn't going to make a fool of myself. <laughs> I was not going to say yes if that wasn't a question. Right. So it was coming up on four weeks. I was so, I was so excited. I was I I was really coming to life, mm-hmm. and I had told my ex husband that he needed to move on because I was moving on, and that four years that opportunity that window had closed, mm-hmm. and I knew it had upset him, and we had gotten into a disagreement, and I went to sleep on May the third. And something inside me, my son, my son was spending the night somewhere else, and I was all alone in the house, and something inside me said, lock your bedroom door. Mm. And I didn't understand that, um, but I also didn't question it. So I thought, okay, I got up and I locked my bedroom door, um, closed my eyes, and I went to sleep. Mm-hmm. And at 2.30 in the morning, I woke up to my bedroom door crashing down, and mm. um, I heard loud yelling, screaming, 
a loud noise, and I I woke up, and my ex husband had broken into my bedroom. He'd broken into my home, and um, I was being met with guns and yelling and screaming and a lot of fear. Oh my goodness, I cannot even imagine what those next few moments were like for you. You know, all I can say is God gave me a gift of calm. Mm. It doesn't make sense because typically your brain and and being a therapist. You know, there's uh, there's knowledge of the brain of the amygdala kicking in and and a brain going into fight, flight, freeze. And um, my brain stayed calm. Mm. And I talked myself through this. And and I remember praying and saying, God, please keep me alive for my children because my children need me. Right. And I would tell myself, just do whatever's asked. Stay calm. Don't don't patronize. Um, Now, that's not to say there wasn't fear because I was very afraid. Right. And for four hours, I was assaulted um, that morning. And something amazing happened during that time. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of fear. But at one specific moment, there was such a calm that flooded me. Mm -hmm. And I felt a presence enter the room. Mm -hmm. And that presence, the only way I can describe it is, it was a presence I knew and recognized, but it was a sad presence. Mm. And I didn't understand what's the sadness. Mm-hmm. And I realized, and I fully believe that that was the presence of God that entered that oh, room. Absolutely. And that sadness is man does have free will and God does not supersede free will. Absolutely. But the scripture, Psalm 23, that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you're with me took on a new meaning Mm. because I knew the heart of God was grieving and I knew the heart of God did not want me going through that. Absolutely. But I also knew in that moment that the heart of God wasn't leaving me. And there was a specific moment where I felt if I die, I will not have died alone. I was not afraid to die because it was like I could reach out and feel that presence. Mm -hmm. Um, When you know, after those so four hours, though, that's a long time to be assaulted. It's a long time. And there was there was a lot of talk and dialogue and it was a long period of time. And and during that, um, you know, there were there were there was some gunfire and there were some bullet holes in my wall. Um, and, your, and your teeth got knocked out. I my front tooth was was, you know, knocked out where I had to have some some dental work done to it. But on the wall where the where the gunshots fired. Later on, you know, after the whole situation was over and I went back to that bedroom, Mm -hmm. I saw that the bullets hit underneath a sign I had on my wall. In that wall, that plaque on my wall, it was a long plaque. It said, the Lord will fight for you. All you need to do is be still. Oh, wow. And the gunshots fired and missed that. But there were holes in the wall, you know, above and actually below that sign. And so... It was after the four hours, right. and um, my ex-husband told me, he said, our kids are going to need you, because I think there was the intent of ending his own life, and and um, he said, the kids are going to need you, but as your punishment, um, you're going to have to go with me, and I'm going to shoot the man you just started dating. Wow. So he had been stalking. I had been, I had been stalked. I had been... Um, but I had been truthful. Mm-hmm. I had been truthful and said, you know what? Um, you know, I am dating somebody and I am getting serious. And I think that w- this is just over. Mm-hmm. And so um, I got in the truck. You know, I, I, my mind went through all my different options. You know, what can I do? Mm-hmm. What, how do I need to stay safe? I was planning, you know, okay, so as we're driving, how can I get out of the car and and my mind was saying, okay, I'm going to wait for a car behind me, and I'm going to open the door, and I'll roll to the side. And right. The only thing is it was early in the morning, and no cars came. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And so my plan didn't work there. Um, you know, I went by a, we drove by a pharmacy, and I thought, well, I can go in the ditch, and I can run. But then I thought, but then it's not open yet, and I'd be an easy target. Right. So now, I thought, But he knew where he lived. He had been stalking him mm-hmm. as well. I don't know that he'd been stalking him, but he knew where he lived okay. because he'd followed me. Okay, He'd gotcha. followed me. Um, yeah, I did. I was not leading directions on where to right. go. And so I just decided, okay, I've got to stay in this truck. And, and so I began praying, um, over, 
who is now my husband. Mm -hmm. I began praying over him, just protection. And and I was hoping he would be getting up early to go to work because by this time it was like quarter to six in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I thought hopefully he had to go to work early that day and was out the door and um, but I began praying and I was just like, Lord, just, just put your angels around him, just protect him, um, protect me. And, and so we drove to, to my new husband's house and, um, my ex-husband looked at me and he said, he left the keys in the ignition and he said, now you can do what you need to do. And so he knew that I was going, I'm sure he knew I was going to leave. And I saw him take three steps up to the house where, where my new husband lives or lived. And I saw him kick the front door, and I heard three gunshots through the front door. And my first thought is, he's dead. Mm -hmm. He's dead. And so I, I was in the truck. I was in the truck I had been driving in, and I jumped into the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, everything was seeming to me to be standing still, yet I was like, where do I go? What do I do? And so I drove um, a few blocks and ended up, at a Walmart, a 24-hour Walmart. And I went in there and I just kind of yelled, okay, someone call 911. And at this point, what, what, what you can't see and what I saw was that, um, you know, there was just blood all over you. Mm -hmm. You had been obviously assaulted for mm -hmm. four hours. So I was a mess. Yes. I was a mess. You know, I was not a calm woman walking in there just saying, hey, I saw something, you know, passing by. Right. It was obvious something had happened to me. Mm-hmm. And I, I walked in and I, I just yelled, call 911. Mm -hmm. And what was really seconds to me felt like it was hours that people were just like looking at me. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why aren't you calling 911? Right. And I had a cell phone in my hand. I, I don't remember putting it there. I don't remember where that cell phone came from. But um, I thought, you know, I thought I'd heard somewhere, even if you don't know the passcode to get into a phone, if you dial 911, uh -huh. it will go through. So I called 911. And I said, you know, you've got to send help. And and I don't remember if I gave the address, the name, that part I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I just remember saying, tell the police to be careful mm -hmm. because this isn't this isn't going to end good. And I, and I don't know if this man is dead or not. Right. And I was taken into a back warehouse while I was waiting for an ambulance to to come and get me. And and um, from that point, I think the adrenaline in my body began to let go. Mm -hmm. And reality of what was happening kind of set in. I cannot imagine what that time was like for you. <sighs> you know, it. It. I remember. <laughs> this is kind of humorous. Learn phone numbers. Don't just do your I, your I contacts. Know, you know, know. your <laughs> with I, cell phones. It's so easy just to hit a a phone number. I know. I don't even know Joe's number. That is terrible. I'm going to do it when I go home. I can relate. I didn't know anybody's phone number. I did not know my children's phone numbers. All I knew was my parents' phone number. And so I called them because I didn't want them to see this on the news. Right. So I called them and I said, I just want you to know this is what happened. I'm going to be taken to this hospital. Meet me there. Um, but just I need you to know that I'm okay. So even in that moment, I'm trying to take care of other people. Um, What's the mother for you? Yeah. I mean, that's what we do, right? That is what we do. <laughs> <laughs> and so this whole time, my mind is what happened right. to Andrew. And Andrew is, is who now is my husband. Um, is he alive? Is he dead? And in my mind, I was beginning to grieve mm -hmm. because I knew he'd be dead. Mm -hmm. And I was taken to the hospital and, um, we were taken to different hospitals is what I later found out. Um, but as I'm going through, you know, having to tell my story over and over again and, and, you know, going through different exams and different, different things, um, I have no clue. The man that I know that I love Here's my second chance. Here's here, God. I remember thinking, God, did you just like wave a carrot in front of my face mm -hmm. and show me something so amazing just for me to lose it? Mm -hmm. And so that began kind of the next. I did not hear from Andrew for three weeks. Wow. And that three weeks is where my life got real. Mm -hmm. um, in those. Uh, I did get a hold of, of, you know, somebody that had worked with him. Um, I tried kind of like a mole. <laughs> right. I would call somebody at work and it's like, okay, just feed me some information, you right. know, because I was, I was so petrified. I would never hear from, from who I believe was just the most amazing person I'd met. Mm -hmm. And I learned that Andrew had been shot nine times. 
nine times. He had been shot nine times. He had been shot twice in the back. He had been shot um, twice, once in each leg, and he had been hit in the femoral artery. So it was, it was, you know, very deadly. And he had been shot five times in his arm. Wow. And um, his family let me know, you know, we just think, I didn't get to talk to him. I just wanted to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And his family kind of let me know, we just think you guys need space because he was in and out of surgeries. Um, I had never met his, his, most of his family at that point. So I'm a crazy lady to them. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, (laughs) when you say to people, uh, how's their family? And you go, they're a hot mess. Uh, Okay. Now this is a little, a little bit more. I can see where the children would be a little protected. (laughs) I think they thought I was Jerry Springer. (laughs) Come to life in my hometown. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, God in his just amazingness Mm -hmm. arranged where I had some family members that were going to Canada for the summer. They lived here in where I live and and they offered to open up their home to me for the summer where I didn't have to go back to my home where where I had lost safety, where I you know where oh, it was yeah. a scary place. I never had to spend another night there. Um I stayed the first few nights with my my parents. Um but then I moved into this beautiful home for the summer where my healing really began. And let's talk about that, Kim, because one of the when you first told me the story, which I was just blown away, and there's so many details in this that you you know you can only highlight on a program like this. But the 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 most amazing part of the story to me is that this didn't define was not the it's, it's like you know when I was divorced, I was like this is not going to be the defining moment of my life. Uh, this you have just just come to this choice, this is not going to be the defining moment of my life. One of the greatest things you said was, I've been victimized, but I am not a victim. That's right. And so talk us through what that process was like. You know, the days following um, when I was harmed, Mm -hmm. uh, I had to go to, it was called the Victim Witness Center, because I knew there was going to be a trial and I'd I'd have to be a witness. And every time I had to sign in, it would would have a place for me to sign in, but it always had the identifier as victim. Mm -hmm. Victim signs here. And I realized that every time I would go in and sign, there was like this anchor that would build up in me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I refuse to be a victim. I am not a victim. I was victimized, but I will not be a victim. I love that. And in fact, I even (laughs) told the district attorney, I said, you really need to change that form. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess there's a legal reason they do that. Um, But that was a defining moment for me of I will not be a victim. And, you know, let me just take a step back to when I was in the emergency room, um, my, one of my children came to me, and one of the first things I said is I looked, at, uh, I looked at one of my children, my daughter, and I said, do not let this make you bitter. Oh, wow. And one of the That's detectives good. later on asked me, the, the detective that came to interview me said, do you remember what you said? The first thing you told us is that I guess there was a detective that was training a new detective. and. And I said, no, I don't remember. And she said, you looked at me straight in the eyes and you said, I will not let the situation go to waste. I'm going to be a better therapist because of this. I'm going to use this to help people because this is not going to be the defining moment for me. Very and good. so in, in those moments, there was a decision, I'm not going to be a victim. Now, that does not mean I didn't have to heal. Right. Because there was grief that went on. Um, there was, there was, you know, just extreme sorrow. And so what happened is in this summer, I call it my summer at the pergola. Um, (laughs) my, my uncle and aunt had this beautiful home and in the backyard there's, there was this beautiful big pergola. Mm -hmm. And I, the first few days I would go out there and I would wrap myself in a blanket and I would lay prostate on the, on the cement and I would sob and mourn like I had never mourned before the sounds that came out of my body just the the sadness um just i let that just my body cried Mm. and probably about the third day i was listening to a song by a man by the name of paul wilbur Mm -hmm. and it's a he's a messianic jew and and the song was dance with me O lover of my soul and it was a song about god being our lover and loving us so much and coming and and searching for us and, and embracing us. And I got up on that pergola, and as a sacrifice of praise, 
I told God, God, I'm so scared to trust you because I want to tell you what you should do, how you should fix this, um, what this should look like. And I think I was a little bit like the little engine that could. Mm-hmm. I was I was saying, I want to trust you. I want to trust you. I hope I trust you. Right. Um, and it got to help me to trust you. Mm. And then it ended with, I choose to trust you. It's not that I feel like trusting you, but I'm making a choice. I'm going to trust you. I was speaking to myself, you will trust. Now, that doesn't mean it was easy. Right. But I would... I think the neighbors probably thought I had mental health issues if they heard, because, you know, it starts off, they're hearing this woman, you know, really crying in the backyard. And, and, um, I literally, I stood up on that cement and I put myself in the position of a waltz dance. And I would listen to that song, Dance with Me, O Lover of My Soul. And I asked Jesus to dance with me. Mm-hmm. And I would, I'd close my eyes and I would waltz with, with an invisible partner around the cement in that pergola. And every day that I did that, I, my prayer was, Jesus, help me to trust you. I'm choosing to trust you. You're my dance partner. Because in dance, one person leads. You can't have two leaders in a dance or it doesn't work. Right. And it was, teach me to follow. Oh, good. And I found I still wanted to be a backseat driver. I wanted to tell God, <laughs> you know, I got on, I got on my, my little Facebook app, my texting, and I, I told all my friends, okay, pray. Mm-hmm. But then I told them how to pray. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pray that Andrew misses me. Pray that Andrew wants to see me. Pray that he comes back to me. And I recognize I can't find my happiness in somebody else. Right. God has got oh, to be good. that ultimate person for right. me. And when I finally took my hands off, my, my prayer ended up being, God, I'm scared to trust you. Mm-hmm. Because what if you don't do it the way I want you to do it? Mm. What if I say I trust you and then you don't, you know, you don't make my happily ever after happen? And this is where, you know, it's easier to trust somebody that you know. Right. And in those three, three weeks specifically, <laughs> I, I, began to know the heart of God. That's good. And I, when I got to that place where I lifted my hands up and I said, God, I trust you, and I recognize this may not go the way I want, and I'm still going to choose to trust you. Now, I was honest with God, and I said, now I'm going to complain, and I'm going to whine, and I'm going to cry if it doesn't go my way, but I'm still going to choose to trust you. Mm. It's not my plans, but it's your plans. And when I did that, something inside me changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I began to recognize it was easier and easier to have that dialogue with the Lord. And I began to look forward to that time in the mornings when it was going to be me and Jesus dancing on the pergola. Now, I'm sure we looked ridiculous. (laughs) And I'm not a dancer. I've never been a dancer. (laughs) So I didn't know how to dance. So (laughs) I wish I had some video of that. (laughs) I don't. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Um, But, you know, on May, I believe it was May the 16th, it had been three weeks, all of a sudden I got this message from Andrew, and it said, I'm alive. Mm. And I'm saying, can I come see you? And I, he, it took a few days, and he invited me to come. He was in the hospital getting ready for a surgery, and I went there, and I didn't know where where this left us. Right. Oh, of course. I didn't know if he never wanted to see me, if this was a goodbye. I didn't know. And so I looked at him and I said, Andrew, where does this leave us? And my heart sank when he said, I don't know. And so I looked at him and pointed my finger in his face and I said, Andrew Hart, you will never meet another woman like me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> and all I can say is on June the 16th, 2017, he proposed to me, uh-huh. and October 8th, we were married. We've been married a year and a half now, and he is my abundantly above all that I could ever ask or I think, and God was such a restorer, but I, those three weeks at the pergola for me, it was the making that decision not to be a victim, mm-hmm. not to be happy only when things go your way. And learning to really kind of do that nesty plunge. I don't know if mm-hmm. you remember that commercial. Oh, yeah. You know, there used to be, you know, for our listeners that don't know the nesty plunge, there was a commercial of, of there was a man standing on a diving board and he was holding nesty 
um, iced tea. Right. And he would put his hands out like in a, a T position and he would do a free fall backwards and, and land in the water. And it was this implication that this tea was the best amazing thing. Right. Just go all in. Go all in. And that was really the God I'm all in. Mm. I'm doing the Nest Tea Plunger Trust. That's so good. And that that's really kind of what led me to to where I am. Um, I will say, on the not being a victim, though, part of not being a victim was that choice. You mentioned that it was being that choice. I had to make a decision, and it wasn't based on my feelings. That's because, good. you know, there's times it may be feelings of anger, resentment, jealousy, criticism, complaining. Um, we don't feel like... It's not fun to necessarily just feel like a survivor because that means you've survived something. I didn't want to be just a survivor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a thriver. Good. And so part of that was having to forgive. You know, that's so true. Um, in my life, every time I've been at a, point, a pivotal point like that, there's always been two things. I've had to make a decision and I've had to make a step of faith. Mm -hmm. Those things go hand in hand to moving to the next place. Otherwise, you just kind of keep going through the what I call the same school of the spirit. You just make another lap yeah. around the same thing. But if you want to get out of where you're in, yeah. you have to, to do both of those things. And um, it's key and it's pivotal. And um, even though I didn't go through such a trauma like as you did, I mean, our lives are somewhat parallel. Yeah. But, um, but the thing is, is, there's so many people out there that are listening to us today. And uh, they haven't been to the depths of that type of tragedy and it was you didn't go snap your fingers and everything turned great your children no. have had to still deal with things and your ex-husband did go to prison he did and um you know there's still ongoing effects just mm -hmm. like there's ongoing effects of divorce that's right um but you made a decision and your path changed that's right so there's people that are listening today and they may say well wow listen to her my 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 where i'm at doesn't matter even though it feels i feel equally as overwhelmed or they may be even in a, in a worse situation. Right. So there's all people all over the map. So just take a minute before we close and just give an encouraging word on uh, what kind of advice would you give them in taking that next step? Absolutely. You know, when you talk about taking that next step, there's an implication of you've got to do something. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be intentional. One of the first things is making that choice that I'm not going to let what I've gone through define me. Mm. You know, I failure is not, it's an event, it's not a person. And that's something I had to learn that where I fit, felt like I had failed as a mom, I had failed as a wife, I'd failed as a Christian, failed as, you know, um, fear's a liar. Yes. The devil wants to try and put a label on you and say, this defines you. Mm -hmm. And so there's the, the first part is making a choice. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm not going to let myself slide into that and feel sorry for myself. Second thing is guard your environment. Guard yeah, your good. environment, guard your mind. You know, those weeks when I was at the pergola, I would listen to faith-filled words. I was in the word. I was studying. I was, God, what do you say about this? Um, you know, music became very important to me during that time and what yes. I was listening to. Um, so guard your mind, guard your environment, guard who you're around and what you're, what you're putting into you. So it's, it's set those boundaries around you. Um, a big part is be willing to forgive. Hmm. not just forgiving other people, because I did. I had to forgive other people. And it went back to forgiving forgiving the women that my husband, ex-husband had an affair with. Oh, I had sure. to forgive those women in my heart. Yes, I had to forgive my ex-husband. And I can honestly say, if resentment or anger was going to be there, that would be a perfect place for it to be. But I have a compassion that God loves him as much as he loves me. And I, you know, me holding on to something just gives me a hardening of the arteries right. and gives me that heart attack. So forgive other people. I had to forgive other Christians. Mm. I had to forgive the church message that I had heard so many times of, of believe, 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 don't give up, don't give up. When my situation is like, God didn't want me in an abusive situation. No, he didn't. And so there's a part of forgiving other people that had told me things that weren't good Advice. I'll say wisdom. It wasn't yeah. good advice. And so I had, to for, I had to forgive people. But then most importantly, I had to forgive me. Mm. And there's a part of being willing to give yourself that grace, give yourself um, that opportunity to step out of that and say, these may be choices I've made, but that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. And then forgiving God. Wow. Some people, you know, as a therapist, I see many people come into my, my counseling rooms and there's a... God, why me? This isn't supposed to happen to me. 
and there's a hardness towards the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of in your own heart recognizing I've held this against God. Mm. And not that God's wronged us, but we feel like he has. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't supposed to happen to me. Why me? Mm -hmm. And there's a part of, you know what? The Bible says we're going to go through hard times. Yes. But we're going to, he's there walking through it with us. And so recognizing that who is it that I need to let go and then making that choice, how do I move forward? And it's one step at a time. It is. And it's living that day. It doesn't mean trust is always easy for me. Right. But each day I remind myself, you know what, Lord? This day, I'm putting my trust in you. Yes. Help me to trust you. And I'm that little engine that could. I want to trust you. Help me to trust me. Phew, I trusted you. That's so good. <laughs> um, and so that, that's really what I would say to the listeners is there's nothing too little. You know, there's, there's big things like what I went through, but something that's not as big to me is like there are things that people have wronged you, and that's just as big. Yeah. That, that's called little T trauma. Mm -hmm. um, it may be you've gone through a divorce. It may be friends have let you down. It may be something's going on with your kids. It may be finances. It may be just life hasn't turned out the way we expected. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of trusting God, trusting his timing. Yeah. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. That's true. I, I tell Joe all the time, um, God is in the restoration mood because mm -hmm. I see people like you. When Kim walks in the door, boy, she's beaming. She is so happy. And that this marriage is so unlike anything that she ever thought she could be a part of. That's right. And that's how I feel every day with Joe. So I totally get it. So we celebrate with you what you're doing and what God has just begun that's in this right. new phase of your life. So if you'd like to get in touch with Kim, please write us here at mail at com. We will certainly forward it to her, and we will certainly have her again as a guest. Thank you, Kim. You've been a, a blessing to have here. Hey, guys, thanks for listening. We love you, and uh, we'll see you soon. Hey, thanks for listening today. Be sure to join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hear more of what God can do in your life. He's got a great future for you and your family, and we are here to help you get there. Make sure and go to our website, JoeBiggieMinistries.com. We've got all sorts of materials, books, DVDs, you name it, all there to help you, your marriage, and your family succeed.